All right, so on to some bone tissues. So let's see. All right, so let me kind of move me again out of the way. You know what, I'm just going to have to hide me. Um, so bone is made of a whole bunch of different tissue types working together. So we have some bone, there's cartilage, there's dense connective tissue, there'll even be epithelial tissue, um, blood vessels, um, adipose tissue, nerve tissue. So really a single bone actually has quite a lot of different parts working together to make it you know, survive and be what it is. So we consider each bone technically an organ in the skeletal system. Um, the bones, again, along with the cartilage, because we're going we're to see we have cartilage at the ends of our bones to help kind of cushion and make joints a little bit more um, kind of smooth moving. Um, so anyway, all of that is going to make up the skeletal system. So let's just talk about some of the functions of bones. I think a lot of these are pretty obvious, but we'll just go over them real fast. So one of the key things, it's going to help support and protect soft tissues. So for example, it helps support and protect your lungs, your heart, right? Classic examples, your brain. Okay. They allow for attachment site for muscles. We would not have our movement um, that we have if we did not have our bones. We'd um, basically end up kind of like inching around like kind of like worms and stuff. Um, <clears throat> maybe at the best octopi on land. Um, so in any case, bones are going to be really important for us to produce the actions that we can produce. Uh, the bones will be important for storage of certain minerals, calcium, and phosphate. We'll talk a little bit about this at the end of um, this lecture, uh, well, I guess a series of lectures. But how important calcium actually is. We're going to see calcium is really important in, oh man, we're, we're nerve conduction, muscle movements, uh, blood clotting, whole sorts of different things in the body. Um, new blood cells are going to be formed in red bone marrow. We call this hemopoiesis. So white blood cells, red blood cells all occur. Uh, new blood cell formation is going to occur in red bone marrow. And then there's a little bit of energy storage in yellow bone marrow as fat. Not a significant amount. It's not like your bones get fat or something. Um, but there is a little bit of energy storage in them. All right, so let's just kind of take a look at a long bone. So a long bone, you can kind of see here the skeleton. So here's the humerus, this arm bone, and then the femur or thigh bone. So any of those bones that you would normally think of as long are considered long bones, right? So the shaft is simply this part in the middle. Um, we call it the shaft or the diaphysis. The epiphysis is going to be an end. So here's the proximal epiphysis. So this is the humerus. So this would be close to the shoulder. Here is a distal epiphysis. So that's the far end. Oops. And let me kind of go back real fast. The metaphysis is simply the area in between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. So if you think of the epiphysis as sort of the head, um, and then the diaphysis as sort of the body, the metaphysis would be the neck. Okay, so it's sort of between the two. Um, <clears throat> the metaphysis will also include something called the epiphyseal plate. Um, that's your growth plate. Um, so basically that's where your bones are going to be growing in that little area. So you can, you can see that in this image as well. So here's the epiphyseal line right here. Um, we'll have what's known as articular cartilage covering the joint surfaces. Again, kind of helping make movement smooth and a little bit shock free. Um, and then in the middle of these bones, um, you know, we don't have hollow bones quite like birds do, but in fact, the middle of our bones, you know, they're not solid all the way through. You do have this middle part, and that's going to be filled with marrow. Okay, and um, depending on your age and your health, usually that middle part, of that marrow, is actually filled with fat. Okay, so that's sort of what these images were that kind of popped up. So this is actually an elk bone, and then here you can see the medullary shaft has been exposed, and here you can see this nice yellow fat in the medulla. Now in this case, here's another animal, um, and instead of this being this nice yellow, this is this sort of gelatinous -y, almost red. Um, so again, as I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, new blood cell formation occurs in this medullary cavity. Um, as you get older, again, it turns into this yellow bone marrow. However, um, when you get sick or you've had blood loss or there's been some sort of illness, that yellow bone marrow can revert back to what's known as red bone marrow and produce um, more of these blood um, elements of blood. 
So in this case, this animal was was diseased or sick. So you can kind of see its long bones and that in um, sorry the, the uh, marrow in its long bones uh, reverted back to this red bone marrow formation. Um, and depending on your ethnicity, sometimes you will actually eat bone marrow. It's a delicacy. You kind of cook it. Uh, usually it's cooked in soup. Um, and then individuals will kind of toast bread, a little bit of, you can see garlic, like some roasted garlic here, some salt. You kind of scoop that out, put that on toast. Um, and it's yummy goodness, I guess. Uh, it is kind of yummy goodness. I've had it before. Um, anyway, so there's that. <clears throat> Lining the inside and outsides of your bone, so lining the marrow cavity and then lining the outside of the bone itself is going to be epithelial tissue. Lining the marrow cavity, we call it endosteum. Um, and then lining around the bone, we call this periosteum. Okay, so it is some membranes, so there's some connective tissue, and there's also some epithelial tissue associated with it. Okay, so you can see the periosteum being peeled away, and then endosteum would be lining the inside. So, and when we take a look at bones, as you as you have already in lab, and you saw the histology. You saw that they're organized in sort of these rings. Um, so, really, you can kind of think of these rings. They're, they're it's called an osteon. Think of that as a tree, right? Um, and really, all that connective tissue it is really separated. The cells of the connective tissue are separated quite a, quite a bit. So, you might have an, a cell here, a cell here, another cell here. They're not dense like epithelial tissue was. Okay. You're going to see four different types of cells in the bone tissue. The first type is called an osteoprogenitor cell or an osteogenic cell. Basically, these cells are undifferentiated and these are dividing cells. Okay, so these are dividing cells. That's the key thing. And these cells will become osteoblasts. Now, here's something just to kind of keep in mind now until you're done keeping things in mind. Um, You'll see, and when we talk about bones, it's going to be osteo something, osteo this, osteo that. Okay, and remember, I think I mentioned this to you before in a previous lecture. We had talked about this term site, which meant cell. And then it gave you, and the word that came before it gave you a clue as to what type of cell it was. So here we have an osteo site, so it's a bone cell. Whenever we see this term blast, it's going to refer to a very special kind of cell that's going to build things. Okay, so blasts build. Um, and in this case, similarly, the thing that's going to build is it's going to be told to you by the word that comes before it. So an osteoblast forms bone matrix. It builds bones. Okay. So again, these osteogenic cells are these uh, precursor cells. These are not differentiated. You can also call them osteoprogenitor cells. Um, they'll divide. They'll turn into osteoblasts. These will build bone. When it's basically done building bone, they will mature and turn into these osteocytes. So that's sort of the progression and age of these cells. Now, we've just discussed that these cells build bone, but a lot of like a lot of things in the body, if you build it, you also have to be able to break it down. Okay, sometimes you're gonna what we're gonna see is that our bones can be reformed. And in that case, the job of breaking down bone falls to something called an osteoclast. And this is a really interesting cell. They're huge. I mean, really huge. This is not, the images are not to scale. They're actually fused monocytes, which is a type of white blood cell. So it's like several of these monocytes kind of fuse together, and they form these osteoclasts. And basically, right along this ruffled border, they're going to break down bone. So they'll break it down. They'll release calcium into the bloodstream at certain times if there's if the levels are too low, um, or if bone needs to be reformed. Okay, the stresses are just have, have changed depending on function. Bone, the matrix of the bones. Remember again, it's a connective tissue, so we have matrix. So one of the things that it's going to have in, in that matrix is going to be what's known as um, an, an, uh, excuse me, an inorganic mineral salt. This will provide a bone's hardness. Okay. The, the mineral salt that we're talking about is called hydroxyapatite. It's actually made up of two different kinds of calcium, calcium phosphate and calcium hydroxide. 
uh, make up this hydroxyapatite, as well as the calcium carbonate. So that's what makes bones hard. But it's really important that you don't just have something that's hard because without flexibility, it will become very brittle. Okay, so along with um, just the, the inorganic salts, we also have collagen fibers in bones. Okay, this allows bones to be a little bit flexible. So when you jump or you bang your arm on something, now granted, bones break. I'm not going to suggest that they don't break. However, it gives it a little bit of uh, plasticity to it, a little springiness to it, so it can absorb some of that shock without just shattering. Okay. You can actually remove the minerals with acid, so I highly recommend this um, to you guys. It's a nice little easy experiment you can do with your kids. Kids love it. I know you guys don't have a lot of time. We're, we're going through this stuff quickly. However, you got a second or you've got some time later on or your kid needs a science project, go and get yourself a chicken. It can be one of those cooked rotisserie chickens. That's totally fine. Um, and get the wishbone. It works best with the wishbone. The thinner the bone, the easier this will be. Um, you know, get all the meat off it as much as you can. I you know, try to do your best. Uh, and what you get is get yourself some uh, white vinegar, just a regular the cheapy vinegar. You know, you can get like a big old bottle for like seventy nine cents at the grocery store. You know, put in it. I would recommend like a Tupperware something that has a lid so you don't spill it. Um, so, you know, pour it in there. Put the bone in. Make sure you've got enough vinegar in there so that it covers the bone. That acid is going to be able to remove the mineral out of the bone. Okay. Um, and basically, like it'll take, it'll take a, a few days. So it depends on the on the on the size of your bone. The thicker the bone, the long it'll take. But take it out like every day, and you can actually kind of like play with it. After like, if you get a wishbone, and you and you cleaned off the meat real well, and it was kind of skinny to begin with. In about four days or so, that it'll look like rubber. It'll almost it'll almost be like a rubber band. You can actually tie it into a knot. Seriously, you can. It's pretty kind of cool. Um, so basically, again, if you're removing all of that inorganic salt, what you're left with is the collagen, and you can actually see the collagen fibers. It's kind of, it's kind of neat. Again, great science project if you have a kid, or you know, you've got like a niece or nephew or somebody, and, and you want to do a science project with them. Highly recommend it. Okay. Alrighty. Hide me again here. Again, not quite solid. Um, we're going to have lots of different spaces for blood vessels and red bone marrow. In adults, the red bone marrow will be in the epiphyses, both the proximal and distal epiphysis. Um, and these areas you see here in the epiphysis of both this humerus and this femur, um, that's called spongy bone. So it's going to have a lot of space in it for, for uh, blood vessels. Compact bone, you'll see that along the diaphysis, um, and it's considered compact bone because it has less of these spaces. It still has some for blood vessels, however, not as many, so it's called compact bone. Okay. And sometimes you'll see compact bone referred to as dense bone, um, depending on what you might be reading. Um, same thing. Uh, again, it looks like a, s a solid layer. It, it I mean, it's pretty solid, but it'll have small holes in it for blood vessels. Um, makes up most of that shaft of the bones, um, the external layer of bones. So even in, like skull bones, you'll have a uh, compact bone. Um, you might have a spongy bone center, kind of like a little spongy bone Oreo cookie kind of thing. Um, and one of the things that you'll see is that these osteons are going to line up sort of the, if, again, if an osteon is sort of like a tree, they'll line up according to... Uh, the stresses being put on that bone. So, for example, in this femur, okay, unfortunately my video stopped, so I don't know exactly where I was, so I, if I repeat myself, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but basically, like I drew right here, uh, these, these osteons are going to line up according to the lines of stress. So in this femur, since you're standing on your legs, these osteons are going to run straight up and down right because that's basically where the weight bearing is going to be in other bones depending on where they are they may run actually horizontally or even at a diagonal okay. so this should be a bit of review for you 
So again, an osteon, so this whole thing is going to be an osteon. It has concentric circles around a central canal or a Herbergian canal. These concentric rings are called concentric lamellae. Uh, in this Herbergian canal or, in the, or the central canal, you will find blood vessels. Uh, in the lamellae, in these concentric rings, is where you're going to find the osteocytes, the actual cells. The cells are going to reside in a little space. That space is called a lacunae, right? So it's sort of like, I guess it's, it's sort of similar like you sitting in a car. You would be the cell. That space of your car is the lacunae, like the inside of your car. All right. There are little, if you, you can kind of see this hopefully fairly well on, on this uh, picture. So here's an osteocyte in its lacunae. Here's one here. Here's one here. And you'll see there are these like little tiny, they almost look like cracks or something, um, where these cells are sort of touching one another. Um, those little spaces are called canaliculi, canaliculi, excuse me, little canals. And those canals are going to be filled with fluids as well as the cells themselves. And so they, they're basically touching one another and allow them to communicate with one another. Um, they're also uh, allowing these cells to pass nutrients and wastes to one another. Because remember, here's your blood vessel. Well, this cell over here is going to need the nutrients and oxygen and whatever from this blood vessel and also needs to get rid of waste. So it needs these little canaliculi so it can either pass it from this cell to this cell to this cell or it can kind of stretch it, you know, part of the way there. So again, it can have this nutrient and gas exchange. Okay. So here's just another view of this. Again, this should be fairly review for you. Um, so here's an osteocyte. So you can see this little cell right here. It is, again, in its space, the lacunae. Um, it ha these cells are also kind of weird looking. Um, they have these long projections coming off of them, and those long projections are in the canaliculi. Okay. Along in here, you get a nice little view of the of periosteum it's around the cell. Or, I'm sorry, around the bone itself is the periosteum. Um, there's endosteum on the inside, very similar to the periosteum. Uh, and then on the periosteum, you'll see there are uh, blood vessels. They penetrate in via what's known as a perforating canal. Um, and then they'll form these central canals. Or they'll, well, I'm sorry, they'll extend in the central canals, I should say. And then you have another perforating canal that connects it to this one. And you may have another one, you know, depending on how large this bone is, it goes here, it goes over here, here. It just depends on how the arrangement is. <clears throat> um, sometimes these perforating canals are also called Volkmann's canals. So again, depending on what you're reading, um, you may see it referred to as that as Volkmann's canals. Okay. So again, perforating canals, another name, Volkmann's canals. All right. So spongy bone is called spongy bone because it, it kind of looks like a little sponge, right? And it's pretty straightforward. Um, it actually is an orientation of plates of bone, these plates of bone, we call them trabeculae. So think of it like, um, I don't know if you, maybe this will hopefully make sense. If you look at this image, it kind of reminds me of antlers, like deer antlers. Um, so like those deer antlers, you know, they kind of go in all sorts of different directions. Well, those would be trabeculae. So these trabeculae, so again, these antlers, what you'll notice is they're, they're going to be oriented again along these lines of stress. So in some bones, so, some, so basically in some of these bones, what that's going to allow is for these lines of stress are going to change from that sort of up and down that we saw like in the femur, and it's going to kind of go at an angle like into the body. So we'll, you know, we, we have the head of the femur. So we'll actually see these, these trabeculae are going to line up so that they allow the bone to kind of have a curve to it, I guess, um, so that, you know, kind of sit in, in your hip sockets. Um, in between these, so imagine like putting a whole bunch of antlers together, you'd end up kind of forming these little spaces uh, in between the antlers. Um, those are going to be filled with red bone marrow. So again, this is where blood cells are going to develop and they can easily get into the bloodstream. You're going to have very specialized types of um, blood vessels there that are going to allow for these, the, the cells to be transported um, into circulation. You particularly find spongy bones um, inside, again, the ends, the epiphyses of long bones and inside flat bones, such as your hips, sternum, skull, and your ribs. So think of all those, those actual uh, flat bones in your body. 
Um, and I, you can see that I have here, there are no true osteons because technically there is no central canal in spongy bone. So even though you still have these concentric link, rings, um, you don't technically have like a true osteon. All right. Um, bones have a very, very good blood supply. Okay, I really want you to. I really want you to th put those sort of two th two things together for me. Obviously, we break bones and they heal, right? Now, whenever we have something that's going to heal, we're going to have to have a very good blood supply. Those cells are going to have to divide. They're going to have to produce new product, whatever that is. Um, so they have to have a very good blood supply. So similarly, bones are going to grow. They're going to break. They reform. It's going to be another key thing. Is they re they they're very good at reforming to stress. So if we put new stress on it, it will change its shape. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So in any case, so bones have actually a very good um, blood and nerve supply, as you see here. Um, so you see, we have different types of arteries. We have periosteal arteries. These are going to be in that periosteum. So on the outside. So here's periosteum. Here's your periosteal artery. And by the way, so the arteries are taking oxygenated blood toward whatever it is. And then, you, well, they're going to be taking it toward, the, toward whatever it is. I should say arteries take things away from the heart. Okay, and veins bring blood back to the heart. Okay, so usually if it's bringing it back to the heart, it's taking it away from something else back toward the heart. So anyway, arteries are taking oxygenated blood to, in this case, um, this bone, it's tibia bone. Um, and then these veins are taking it away back toward the heart. we will have nutrient arteries. Um, and so let me see here. So you have this nutrient artery and vein um, right here, um, taking um, blood to and from that medullary cavity uh, in, in the bone. Um, you'll see there's a nutrient foramen. Um, and we'll talk about this in, in a little bit. Um, so foramen means a hole. Um, then you have the metaphysial and epiphysial arteries. That should be an S there. I'm sorry about that period. Um, get, so basically, they're simply supplying the red bone marrow um, with blood vessels in those areas. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. Um, again, as always, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to email me.